Good evening. I call to order the Lakewood City Council study session of April 17th, 2017, 7 p.m. in the city of Lakewood. Will the clerk please call roll? Paul? Here. Boop? Here. Wickman? Here. Gutwine? Here. Franks? Here. Harrison? Here. Royball? Here. Vincent? Here. Abel? Here. Johnson? Here. Shakti? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you to those who came out tonight or might be tuning in. This is a subject that's been somewhat on the radar for some time and some communities have tackled it. And we're going to have a presentation tonight to take a look at what direction the city of Lakewood would like to go. So before I start, uh, I'd open public comment on this subject in and of itself. And has anybody signed up to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public comment on that and invite Ms. Erin Bravo up from the planning department to talk to us a little bit about short-term <laughs> rentals. Good evening. Good evening, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I'm a planner of the city, um, so as- Pull the mic close, yeah, thank you. Is that better? Yep. Okay. So as Mayor Paul, described we're here tonight to sort of explore short-term rentals um if you recall the the staff had presented some draft language in the um, zoning ordinance update a few months back and we were asked to um, actually revisit it come back with some more information so that's why we're here tonight so thank you all for having me and let's see if this guy's working so tonight um, we'll just go ahead and take you through a brief overview of short-term rentals and the sharing economy um, introduce you to sort of the concepts if you're if you're not aware um, we'll look at short-term rentals in Lakewood so focusing on our city and then some local comparisons looking at some policy considerations what some other municipalities and jurisdictions look at when they're you know facing this question do we regulate or do we not um, and then some of our next steps so basically we're gonna look to you to let us know what our next steps are so before we jump into uh, short-term rentals, I wanted to start with big picture. So this honeycomb here um, is representative of the shared economy, also known as the collaboration economy um, and the empowered economy. And basically that's, it's all about leveraging information technology to empower individuals, government, uh, corporations, nonprofits with information uh, which is then used to promote distribution sharing and the re reuse of excess uh, goods and services. So basically using technology to show where there's some um, inefficiencies in goods and services and uh, getting exposure that way. So this image is a graphic representation of the various industries that have extended into this realm of the sharing economy. Um, the goods and services within this honeycomb represent really well-known um, economies like the transportation mobility, Uber, Lyft, um, those shared spaces there, as well as, you know, consumer goods. So Etsy, for instance, allows you to, uh, or an artist to share their homemade goods um, to a huge market that wouldn't be available to them unless the online platform was available. Um, there's even eBay and Craigslist that allow you to post used items um, that you can search for in your vicinity um, to reuse some items that people no longer need all the way down to uh, the food industry where if you feel like having a dinner party but are maybe looking for a different group of people that share the same palate, you can use uh, Feastly and, and organize a, a feast with some, some folks that maybe share the same interest in food as you. So there's this whole spectrum of the sharing community that we're seeing and it's, it's um, growing in capacity each day. And so uh, the goods and services created by these shared economies really do seem endless. Um, each color, I know you can't read everything on the screen, but just know each color represents a different type of industry. Then there's subsections within those industries. And really this is just showing um, how many businesses exist. And this is back in 2016 that were captured solely because of the internet and this information share that's now available for goods and services. So that's sort of the, the purpose of that image there. So if we focus in on one little honeycomb and one section of it, um, we, we come to personal space and this is our short-term rental space. Um, so what is short-term rental? Uh, it's typically a rental, um, most often defined as under 30 days consecutive rental. Um, most often they're between two to seven days. All of these companies on the screen use online platforms to provide an alternative to staying with friends or family or in a hotel, motel, bed and breakfast, 
hostel while you're traveling for business or pleasure. Um, so out of the 14 companies listed here, I circled the two big players, uh, HomeAway and Airbnb. And for you number of folks out there, I'm just going to kind of throw out some, some economics. So HomeAway has acquired over 23 rental companies since 2004. So they've purchased up some other various online um, companies that were offering this sort of rental service. They've purchased them up. They now have over 1 million rentals in 190 countries and are valued at $3 billion. They are second to Airbnb, um, who began in 2007, and currently have over 3 million rentals in 191 countries, um, and they are valued now at $31 billion. Um, so that's pretty incredible. Um, but to give you some comparables, so Hilton Worldwide, the more traditional um, accommodations industry, is valued at $20 billion and has over 758,000 hotel rooms in 100 countries and territories. And then we've got uh, Marriott International, which is valued at $34 billion. So well over the Hilton Worldwide, they have over 1.2 million hotel rooms in 122 countries and territories. So um, although the user-based network accommodations, Airbnb, HomeAway, they haven't yet surpassed these traditional accommodation um, service providers. They, uh, and Uber and Lyft actually have um, surpassed the private transportation industry, but these seem to be well on their way to surpassing some of the more traditional accommodations. So I just wanted to give you sort of a snapshot of the economics and the billions of dollars that are going into this. So um, we'll just go ahead and move on from that. Real quick, um, some of you may feel like this these came out of nowhere you know where do they come from and you know I think arguably they they could you could interpret it that way that they kind of did in 2007 I mean people have been renting out spaces and whatnot but with this internet platform making it so accessible you know it, things are really ramping up quickly and so in 2007 these two guys in uh, San Francisco are having a hard time paying their rent so they decided to make a website and say hey we've got a, three air mattresses and we'll make you breakfast if you want to stay here for 80 bucks you can do it that worked they continued to do so um, through 2008 and 2009 they were fundraising incredibly by 2011 they raised one or 11.2 million dollars for this endeavor and then even more incredibly in 2014 they were valued at 10 billion dollars and then um, by the second quarter of 2016, they actually turned profitable. It's a pretty quick turnaround, and now they're valued at $31 billion today. So that's, again, just sort of a recap of the economics. So what are the, obviously there's some drivers for this, and you know, so I wanted to lay some of them out there for you. You know, why do people want them and why are they so popular? Um, these are common reasons um, that we found. So the internet platforms, um, they really showcase the supply and demand. Um, if you have access to the internet, you can basically participate. Um, so it's, it's very accessible. Um, global tourism and connect connectivity, if you have access again to the internet, you can basically book a flight across the world in an instant. You can book your accommodations in an instant. So this is just playing into sort of that globalization that we're seeing in affecting a number of our, our different industries. Um, this desire for work-life balance. So, you know, there's a number of examples where folks that utilize Airbnb or the short-term rental um, service providers are actually paying, you know, for their vacations while they're gone, you know, by renting out their houses. And so sort of just opening up a, an income stream that wasn't there before to offer them some additional um, a, allowing them to afford some additional things that maybe they couldn't before. Um, the popularity and familiarity with the shared economy is playing into this as well. People are more comfortable using online platforms, they're more secure, things of that nature, sharing their even, you know, their bank accounts and things like that online. Um, and with the review-based system, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, people are just becoming more and more comfortable with them. Um, there's a number of markets uh, where there's increased housing prices, so this might help folks um, and I'll kind of hit these last three, share some of the efficient, you know, making more efficient use of their space, um, helping them pay off their, pay for, you know, part of their mortgage or um, their expenses uh, day to day. Say you're on a set income and you've got property taxes that are raising, you know, sharing your space, having people help with some chores around the house or be able to fund, you know, maybe other services that help you kind of age in the place that you're at are all kind of reasons why, why these short-term rentals are, are so popular. 
So without beating the common points of support, I think we touched on those, just some common points of concern uh, for short-term rentals. Um, these are pretty um, consistent across the board when you look at various municipalities who have you know, taken on some um, community research. Um, you know, what do, the, what do short-term rentals do to the affordable housing options in a city? Um, does, is there a potential for it to reduce the affordable housing availability? Um, you know, there's conflicts associated with residential household limits, so number of people in a home um, with visitors, noise, parking that's generated. Um, you know, you're inviting folks into the community that maybe wouldn't be there before, which could impact the co community cohesion, um, you know, potentially reinforce class, gender, and racial inequalities, and that's really because um, as a host, you can pick and choose who you allow to stay um, at your um, unit. And then that it unfairly competes with the established accommodations industry. This is mainly in, in terms of taxes. Um, so any accommodation, like a hotel, motel pays accommodation fee. If you aren't regulating them, you're not collecting taxes. So there's sort of an unlevel playing field there. So those are some of the common concerns. All right. Oops. I think I went past. Sorry about that. All right, so before we focus strictly on Lakewood policy currently, I just wanted to briefly go over how these work. Um, so the user includes both host and uh, renter. Um, they use an online platform, website, app, whatever it may be, to post and browse accommodations. You can browse by city, price, neighborhood, amenities, et cetera. Um, while the online service providers, they don't actually provide the consumer experience, they provide the platform in which you can, um, you know, they'll provide you with customer service, making sure that if you had a really terrible experience, that person gets warned and sort of goes through this regulatory um, process of being vetted out of the system if need be. Um, users post reviews of their hosts and their renters, which is sort of the self-regulated on the ground, how you make sure that people are you know, following your rules when they're using your services. Um, so that's really the on-the-ground review of people. And if you get negative reviews, again, like I mentioned, you can say no thanks to that person. They only have two stars. They've got a bad reputation. You're not welcome to stay. Um, so in their words, the online service providers like Airbnb um, provide or, I'm sorry, they connect people with unique travel experiences at any price point all around the world. Uh, with world-class customer service and a growing community of users, Airbnb and the like are the easiest way for people to monetize their extra space and showcase it to an audience of millions. So rehashing what we've mentioned before, but just so you know kind of how they're marketing themselves. Um, so clearly they're popular. Um, and as we transitioned into the conversation about Lakewood, I just went ahead and took a snapshot. I jumped on Airbnb um, this month and just took a snapshot when you type in Lakewood, Colorado, and you can see that there's clearly residents that are using um, the service and participating in this economy. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, even though they're not um, allowed today in residential, because of the online platforms, they're very um, it's still accessible to folks, and, and the number is, is pretty amazing, and we'll, we'll touch on that in just a moment. So Lakewood's current policy, short-term rentals are not allowed by right in any residential zone district. So that's our current policy. Um, short-term rental uses, um, there's three categories that sort of encompass what a short-term rental is, the 30 days or under, and that's hotels, motels, and bed and breakfast. Um, hotels and motels are allowed in our mixed-use general, mixed-use core, mixed-use employment, and CR zone districts. Again, those are non-residentially focused uh, zone districts. So that's where those hotels and motels are allowed to be currently. And then um, bed and breakfasts are only allowed if you get a special use permit, which is a public process. Um, and those are... Um, you're only allowed to pursue a special use permit if you're in one of our larger lot residential zone districts, in our multifamily zone district, or in the MN, which is mixed use neighborhood. So there, um, you know, potential for having a bed and breakfast that has to follow the supplemental standards um, that are some just additional standards about owner occupancy and, um, you know, building code and things like that in the special use permit or with a special use permit but ultimately just so we're clear they're not allowed right now by right in any residential zone district 
So what's our sort of current status of short-term rentals in Lakewood? Um, we've got, we've had approximately 22 complaints um, since 2012 about short-term rentals operating. Um, the most typical complaint is that there's, you know, too much noise or the number of people that are coming in and out of the house at all different hours. Um, there's been some complaints about, you know, smoking pot and, you know, the partying and whatnot that's going on at these rentals. Um, the source the um, complaining party is are typically neighbors. Um, the action is that, you know, code enforcement does go out. They request that they stop immediately operating as a short-term rental and that they remove their posting. Um, we've only had one repeat offender, so I think it's they're doing a great job when we do get calls. Um, code enforcement operates on a complaint-based system, like in, in many standards across the city of Lakewood, so they're doing a great job there. Um, in terms of our finance department, uh, they'll occasionally get folks handing in a business license who maybe haven't read through or talked with the planning department to know all the standards, you know, that they want to start a, a short-term rental or operate a short-term rental. So they've had about approximately 15 in uh, 2016 and 2017 that they just kind of say, you know, you need to talk with the planning department. There's more of a process than just a, an operating business um, and getting a business license. Um, from the planning perspective, we probably get about one inquiry a week on average, and most of ours are people who want to operate them and wonder what the process is in order to, to get there. Um, as I showed you, even though they're not allowed, um, Airbnb has over 300 listings in Lakewood, and so does VRBO, not to say that some of those don't cross and multi, you know the same listings on both, but just sort of an illustration that um, you know we've had 22 complaints, 300 are potentially operating, 300 to 600 are potentially operating, um, and you know we are enforcing as as they come in, but that's sort of the state of it. And we've had one um, uh, property come in for a special use permit; they were approved for a bed and breakfast in an R112 zone district. So we do have one property that has gone through our process. So what are our neighbors doing? Um, so in the different columns, we've got a couple of different cities, counties listed there for you. Um, you know, mentioning if they've adopted specific short-term rental policy, if they are, if short-term rentals are allowed with a license, and then kind of what their required occupancy is. And I'll talk a little bit why that's important in just a moment. So Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, and Jefferson County have all gone ahead and moved forward with drafting policy and adopted it that's specific to short-term rentals. Um, and they also all require a license to go along with those rentals. Um, in Fort Collins and Jefferson, well, in Fort Collins, you can have um, a short-term rental in both your primary and potentially a non-primary residence, but the non-primary residence is only in certain zone districts. Um, Boulder and Denver both only allow them in their primary residence. The main reason is because it, um, with the impacts it could have on affordability of housing and short, you know, long-term rentals and for sale uh, units. Jefferson County only allows them in non-primary residences. Um, and then Arvada, Wheat Ridge, and Littleton, much like Lakewood, have an adopted specific policy um, and they're not allowed in Arvada and Wheat Ridge. In Littleton, it's a little bit different. Uh, if the plan development doesn't explicitly say no to them, you can actually operate them if you pull a business license. So it's a little different. Um, I pulled up a few mountain towns. Um, there has been a really, there's a really good study out there that was done in 2015 by CAST, uh, which is basically a, the Coalition of Mountain Towns. Um, what was it? Thank you. Um, and so they put together a great study. So I just wanted to put them up there. Um, but we are very different on the Front Range than Mountain Towns. They have a very different sort of economy around their vacation houses and second homes. And so, you know, when looking at their policy, it, it is it is different um, in terms of their situation versus our Front Range. So, um, but they all have adopted policy. Um, they all require a license. And then you can see that... Um, in Durango and Breckenridge, they allow them in both primary and non-primary residence. And in Estes Park, it's actually only in your non-primary. So second, like your vacation home or a um, secondary residence. All right. So again, why are cities considering this short-term policy? Um, you know, because there's some pressure to do so. Um, 
pressure to address, recognize, and balance issues of supply and demand. You know, there's underutilized space on display, and people just want to take advantage of it. Um, tax equity, like I mentioned, the accommodations industry wanting to see fair taxation. Um, innovation, technology is and continues to help turn ideas into action. And um, cities will most likely need to depend on our own innovations to kind of keep up and keep ourselves able to enforce um, the, these regulations that we're putting in place. Uh, sustainability and efficiency, again, making the most of underutilized space and using space that exists instead of maybe creating new spaces. So maybe instead of additional buildings, it's utilizing the space that we already have built. And tourism, uh, people wanting to travel for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, each city is very different, so we would never want to say we should, you know, mimic what any other city is doing in an absolute form because city, uh, the city of Lake was very unique in its own right. You know, we're not a mountain town. We're not a fracking town. There's a lot of different components that we would want to consider if we're going to move forward developing policy. And then, of course, safety and enforceability, making sure that our communities are safe, that people feel safe in our communities, and that anything that we do create in terms of policy is enforceable. All right. So as we're kind of going through this exercise, you know, we want to think about what do we want to accomplish? So who we are, who is Lakewood, who are we trying to um, who are we trying to work with and make sure that you know we're establishing processes that make sense? Um, how might short-term rentals impact the quality of life in our communities? Um, can we provide a convenient path to compliance? Do we have the tools right now um, that we could utilize to create this convenient path, or are we going to have to innovate a little bit and kind of get creative with um, how we ensure that making compliant or getting people into compliance is relatively easy for them? Because um, we know that it's more likely that they'll come into compliance if it's easy. Um, and how will this reflect on our business friendliness? Again, our relationships with the accommodation industry and um, other businesses, you know, even potentially neighborhood businesses that are maybe profiting from the short-term rental business. Um, and then how do we ensure, again, that these policies are enforceable? And I keep kind of hitting that one because there's a lot of policies out there that sound good on paper, but they're really, really difficult to enforce. So I think that would be something that we'd really want to um, pay attention to. All right, so getting back to the question of the evening, um, would you like us to revisit Lakewood short-term policy, uh, or Lakewood's policy on short-term rentals? Um, if we don't want to revisit the short-term rental policy, we can certainly just keep regulating as is. Um, if we get the direction to sort of draft new regulations or explore more, um, you know, we'd be looking at location standards nights per year limitations, owner occupancy requirements, license requirements, et cetera. The good thing is there's a number of communities that have done extensive research. So we kind of have some good guiding questions and some good examples to help us create some of these policies and maybe see what's working and what's not. Um, so we've got some good case studies. And of course, um, it's not just a planning effort. If it's um, something that we do want to explore uh, moving forward with in terms of creating a policy, there's a number of different entities within the city that would need to be a party to um, the policy development. So the city clerk with licensing, the finance department with tax collection, um, legal planning with the zoning ordinance, the police department with enforcement, and obviously public works, building permits, and things like that. All right. So with that, thank you for your time. And we're happy to answer any questions. I'm sure you've got a lot. Um, we've got some research that we've done. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have. And if maybe we don't have the answer, certainly happy to come back to you with that information. So thank you very much. Ms. Bravo, thank you very much for the presentation. Very informative and um, quite interesting. So before I go to questions, I just want to also just reinforce. So I guess before us tonight for council is... Um, do we want to do anything and if if we do want to do something what that looks for looks like going forward and that could even be a direction to to staff to put some things together and maybe create a committee that consists of not only the folks that we saw on that slide but also uh, residents uh, outside stakeholders uh, hotel lodging things like that so keep that in mind and I'll start uh, on my left with Councillor Abel um, I hardly know where to start here. 
There is a lot to cover. Uh, right now, I believe I asked uh, Mr. Parker about it some months ago when the subject first came up, and he said we were handling these like bed and breakfasts. But I noticed B&Bs require a special use permit. Uh, I guess then we have not had any of these that we actually permitted. I see we did have one B and B. So where are we uh, as far as uh, permits for these things right now under this system? Can they operate at all? It, at this time, um, we haven't allowed any short-term rentals in Lakewood. Um, the one special use permit was approved with neighborhood support, and I believe it was uh, late 2014, early 2015. Um, but at this point in time, the short term and rentals, again, um, if we get a complaint, code enforcement goes out and asks them to stop. But at this time, they're not allowed. And is, was that an actual bed and breakfast or was it a short term rental? It was a bed and breakfast and there are standards that they needed to comply with and the approval and so forth. And, and the uh, uh, owner is always there when they have a guest. Okay. Um, one of the major issues of these would be to bring, to capture the uh, tax revenue. And I notice was it Boulder or Denver that had to have a special election to capture tax revenue from uh, make these things eligible for their hotel and motel tax? Would we have to do that as well? Uh, no, Mr. Abel, we would not. Um, currently, Finance Department treats um, short-term rentals as um, basically similar to any sort of other lodging so it applies an accommodations tax as well as requiring a sales and use tax so they have to get two licenses um would we require these folks to have a a license or a business permit uh, or both well currently they would they would have to have an accommodations license just like a hotel would sure. Um, and they'd also have to have a separate sales and use tax license okay. to capture all of. But would we determine that whether we require a. Uh, well, generally, our, our sales and use tax license essentially doubles as a business license, but we could decide to have a separate business license. Um, there's a, you know, there's a spot in the code in Chapter 5 where we address different kinds of businesses. So that's, that's one way to approach it. Some of these uh, communities have a uh, tax collection through a third party like Airbnb itself. Uh, others want to collect it directly from uh, the operator. So um, I'd like to know when we get to this what y'all, what you folks think would work best for us. Um, A number of these cities uh, limit permits, and Durango, for instance, limits it to 60. And I don't know how those work, whether they're renewed annually, whether they're on a rotating basis. I'd like to know how, if we require permits how, and a limited number of permits, how we would uh, uh, strike a tone of equity there. Um, I don't think that everybody ought to be able to go out and throw up an ADU in the backyard and start uh, having overnight paying guests. Um, there are a number of, uh, on Airbnb, a number of single room short term rentals. So that anybody who had a room, I mean, most of them are like master suites and have their own uh, toilet facilities, but a single room, uh, I don't, we need to consider whether we want to let that uh, stand as a Airbnb uh, accommodation. Uh, and of course, there's the primary, non-primary residence uh, question, and we have the, do we let them have them in ADUs or? Uh, um, some cities require it to be the primary residence of the property owner. So if he lives in an ADU and rents out his main house, 
this would have to be the ADU and then or vice versa. Um, Estes Park notifies neighbors before these things are permitted. And then they have a uh, regulation that uh, holds the homeowners accountable for the actions of the renters, any damage they might cause in the neighborhood. Which brings me to a question from Ms. Harrison. When we get around to that, uh, do homeowners policies cover these kind of things or would they would should we require extra insurance to cover off-premises damage uh, from renters that sort of thing uh, who do the police contact do they contact the renter or the homeowner or both and in i believe in Estes park they have a, me a method of uh 24 having a 24 hour property management contact so if there is trouble the city can call those folks or the police can um, and then i think we need to hear from the competition what do our current b and b and hotel and motel owners think uh, i have other things but i'll yield the floor for now ms franks and then um, Ms. Shakti. Um, and I'm not going to request a response to any of these. I'm just going to kind of throw these out as other points of consideration because I think there's a lot of things to cover. Um, for the nights per year, I'm just trying to envision how that is what the visibility is to that, what the enforcement is, whether those agencies like Airbnb, whether they um, report out, you know, numbers of days of rental, if, if there's any kind of body that can say, because if you're trying to say, you know, 30 nights maximum per year, how do you really, you know, know that? And then it turns neighbor into kind of reporting on neighbor, which can be a, an uncomfortable situation. Um, I think we also need to be very cognizant about maybe the maximum number of separate rentals per house because I could have a five bedroom home and so then I could have potentially four separate rental agreements going on at any one time for each of those units so I think we need to be cognizant of that aspect um, as those of us who've heard from residents who already have off have parking issues along streets I think that we would have to look at maybe requiring that those renters had an off street space, which might require folks to put in some improved, um, you know, surfaces for their areas. Um, I think it's also important to talk about a, a, another aspect of this, which is um, the fact that these units offer very unique housing opportunities folks who may have uh, children who are maybe autistic and don't do well in crowded them so the plus side of that is being in a home environment being somewhere uh, where there's not a lot of activity there's some real benefits there um, for those folks and so there's that as well as maybe folks who are in town visiting a relative who's got an illness long term where they're looking for uh, some more home-based type of an environment so i think that we know we want to certainly talk about the benefits it can bring to our communities as well as some of the challenges um i also i think we need to kind of understand about the uh, fact that we do have folks for whom uh, it's getting very expensive to live just in general in the metro area and so these income streams could keep people in their homes um, which has some significant benefit to some of our folks as well um, it also offers some level of companionship to folks who may be so again I'm trying to kind of see that there's there's multiple dimensions to this um, would also like us to be cognizant about the fact that um, these um, rentals will be generating income and what level of responsibility do we have to ensure that they're you know paying their fair share um, maybe none maybe some but again it's something to be considered um, I do have concerns about food service options, making sure that, you know, if people are serving food, you know, how do we know that uh, maybe that's uh, safe and, and, and for them as well? And is there any responsibility for food service if somebody's offering a bed with, with a meal and that type of thing? And then the last thing I had was the maximum number of pets. Is that going to be if people are allowing pets to be a part of that rental agreement? Do we have limits on the combination of the homeowner's pets that might still be there the the pets that might come with those rental uh, agreements and so those are just the things I wanted to kind of throw out there for just general thought and consideration and I will yield the floor great comments 
I have um, Counselor Shakti and then Harrison. So I tend to be an early adopter of many of these new um, schemes. I, uh, I loved Netflix for like, when did it start? 10, 15 years ago. I loved the Funwa bus, which was when you were in Boston going to New York, it cost $100 to take a bus. And then all of a sudden there were these Chinese buses that cost $10. And I only had $10, so it was really good. Um, I love car to go. I love Airbnb. Um, that said, the Funwa buses kept catching on fire. <laughs> so some regulation to make it reasonable was important. And what we ended up seeing was, um, over time, a more reasonable middle ground was reached. Um, so. Airbnb, Airbnb in specific, um, the fact that it's so global is amazing. Um, I was just um, in Vietnam in an Airbnb. Before that, I was in Bangkok in an Airbnb. Um, the fact um, that you, you can have kitchens, um, it's, so it's different than being in a hotel. Um, the fact that small and medium players can be involved, both in saving money as a traveler and making money um, from their home. Um, and so that's obviously true if you're renting out your home. But then even the people who, um, when I was in Vietnam, there was a man there who built a house so that he could rent it on Airbnb. He didn't have money to have a hotel, but he was a, a medium-sized actor. Um, and then for me, I love the opportunity to be in other people's houses. I, and apparently I have like a latent architect or designer in me. Um, and and you, you experience the world in a different way. You get ideas about how you might want to live. Um, so that's my starting place. Um, I, I think there's a lot of room for appropriate regulation to make it this work in neighborhoods. I think it makes sense for us to come up with, I mean, at this point, uh, our rules are strict enough that it's as if we have no rules because everybody's just doing it anyway. Um, and so I think it makes sense to come up with rules that really address people's concerns and make it so that people can do this in Lakewood and it works for the neighbors. Um, so just to, th through some of the ideas, um, uh, I am concerned about affordable housing. I don't know what kind of ideas there might be out there of um, ways, whether it's a pro or a con and um, what things might have a positive impact. Um, I've actually never done the single room rentals, but I think that they're a nice um, idea of, in terms of affordability for people that, that um, I happen to know that you can go to Mexico City and stay in a nice room for $10. Like, th this gives opportunities to people who wouldn't have those opportunities otherwise. Um, I think that a lot of it really will come down to the number of people allowed in, a, in an Airbnb. So what's the appropriate number of people for a house what, in terms of parking? Is there, so uh, ostensibly there's parking for the people in that house, so you don't, need special parking, but if they're renting it out to a lot more people than live in the house, there needs to be appropriate parking. Um, I think there could be some system, if you have a license, if there's a, more than a certain number of noise complaints, then the license is pulled, something where the, the renter has the obligation to, and, and they're set up in different ways. So some of them are set up as like party areas and they will get noisier. Um, and and making the license contingent in that way will reduce that. Um, I don't like the idea of having certain locations where we allow it and certain where we don't. I think in um, high density apartments, they work. And I think in other kinds of residential neighborhoods, and I don't think we should be telling our residents that some of them can do this and some of them can't and creating sort of an inequality there. Um, I can see both ways in terms of should there have to be owner occupancy. Maybe you could say there has to be owner occupancy plus we have a set number of other permits, something like that, if we're going to limit the number of permits. Um, I think people should be paying taxes. Um, 
And I think that in terms of, there's a conversation about off property, off damage created off property. Um, I think that it makes sense to hold the owners responsible for that. I'm curious how often that really happens. Um, and in terms of what insurance we require, I think that question of how often does it really happen would be relevant, but it makes sense to continue that conversation. Good list. Thank you. And I have uh, Ms. Harrison and Ms. Johnson and Ms. Gutwein. Thank you. Um, I need to start at the top. Um, even though Shakti is an early adopter of all these wild ideas, I'm really old fashioned. I like the Marriott, okay? So what I need you to, and maybe just other people that might be listening, what's the difference between a bed and breakfast and an Airbnb? I understood bed and breakfast meant the owners were there to feed me breakfast in the morning, and I also understood that Airbnb, the, the owners are elsewhere. Am I understanding it correctly? <laughs> That, that is correct. However, I think as Aaron was pointing out with all the different entities online, um, those definitions are starting to blur a little bit. So the city of Lakewood, and if you get me, let me kind of mumble and find here. Um, the city of Lakewood, we have defined what a bed and breakfast actually is in our zoning code. And so if you would like to do a bed and breakfast, you come before the planning commission and you make a case. And so a bed and breakfast is oper operated by uh, the occupant. Um, it has to meet all the standards of the zoning code. Um, food service is restricted to the, to the guest of the uh, home. Um, the dwelling unit needs to still look like a house. So you can't add or make this huge monstrosity of a home just to be a big bread and breakfast. You, you're kind of moving beyond the house into um, a hotel. A hotel. Um, signs comply with the sign code and they're typically fairly, fairly small. Um, off street parking, you, you have to accommodate um, the, the number of rooms that you're, that you're renting out. Parking needs to comply with our standards. And then um, if you also do uh, go through the bed and breakfast process, you're, you're subject to our site planning process. So you may not make a lot of changes to the site itself. Um, let's say you're gonna do some additional driveway improvements, but we wanna know what that space looks like. Um, it wouldn't be as major as you know coming in and doing another development, but we do, so one, um, these are conditions of the approval. So if you violate any of these, the Planning Commission can revoke the bed and breakfast uh, special use permit. And then two, we want to know what it looks and feels like um, within the neighborhood. So that's a that's kind of your typical bed and breakfast. And then uh, Air, as Airbnb, um, you know, the the when they started out, uh, the the gentlemen were leasing, and then they were st all staying there together. Typically, um, what you're seeing now is you know a family leaves, so they lease their home, so they're not there. But there's other entities that uh, I'm not familiar enough with how they all operate, but I could get some more information on that. that Those would lines be one are starting of the questions to blur. that I would have because I think if the owner was still in the home there, there would be a lot more control in terms of the damage and the, and the neighborhood complaints and whatnot. But I don't know, I wouldn't want to go in and stay in somebody else's home. I, I, that's just my how I feel about it, but um, especially if they were there, um, maybe a close friend or something like that, but I, a complete stranger, I would be, have a really hard time doing that. Um, but I'm an old dog, so, you know, that certainly could be um, different in the future. Um, in terms of the insurance question, this is kind of a new um, idea in terms of homeowner's insurance. Some companies actually offer an additional rider for this because it's business pursuits. And usually a homeowner's policy ha actually excludes business pursuits unless you actually add an additional rider so that would be one thing and not i um i know we are not in um 
a broker for a lot of different companies and ours has just recently added a writer for Airbnb locations and and it has to be approved in the locale that you're in before you can get the coverage under your insurance. So I think that there's some liability risk that we'd have to look at there as well as whether or not it would even be approved in Colorado and by, and by what insurance companies because that could be an issue that we'd have to look at. Um, on the pro side, one of the things I'm always concerned about how to help people stay in their homes. And there's a lot of probably big homes that have only one person living in it because spouse has gone and the kids are gone and they're trying to figure out how to make ends meet. This might be a good um, opportunity for that senior to stay in that home if possible if all of the rest of the regulations are put in place to where it's a safe thing for them. Um, I'm, I, I have a lot more questions, but that'll be where I'm going to stop for now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson and Gutwein then Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, like you, Karen, I prefer to stay in a hotel rather than in somebody else's home. I understand that. And that might just be that our generation, I don't know. I've got a lot of questions and concerns actually about this. And I'll start. Uh, when you're talking about having a, a house that has many bedrooms and perhaps renting out different bedrooms and then having a car per bedroom, I think we've already got an issue that as a council that I'm hopeful that we will be addressing at some point soon regarding residences um, having up to, I think it's seven cars per home as it is. And that seems to be causing a rub in a lot of neighborhoods the way it already is. This to me would add some, some strain regarding uh, the amount of cars. Um, do we have any kind of a guesstimate how many of these are already operating in Lakewood? With their, their per, Right now, the short-term rentals are not legal, correct? Do we have any idea how many are operating, even though there's... So I looked at the two big players, VRBO and Airbnb, and both showed 300 plus listings on each site. Um, so not, I don't know how many of those overlap, yeah. but so maybe between 300 and 600. Okay, actually that's my next question. If we know that they're operating and they're illegal and we can go on site and find them and see them, are we internally tracking that and then going after them knowing that they're already there and they're illegal? I mean, it's, they're kind of like baiting us. Are we following up on that? We aren't. And if you look at the... You are or not? We are not doing that. Um, if, and if you look at the websites, a lot of time the address isn't listed, so we can't go on and figure out. You'll see a dot um, in a neighborhood but it doesn't give you the ac exact address. Some we can find the address, some we can't. Um, and then there's just the resources to go online. We, we would have to have someone re monitoring the websites. And I don't know how many Erin listed up there. I think she said around 20, just in the little diagram. So you gotta, gotta have someone going to 20 different websites, looking for all the listings specific to Lakewood. And then we would have to send uh, code enforcement officers out to um, you know, notify each resident. So um, they're out there. And, and as you saw from the complaints that we had, you know, we, we haven't had a, a lot of complaints coming actually into um, uh, our offices. This is just an editorial. I'm not real comfortable with accommodating people that are doing something illegal anyway. I mean, they obviously know that, that they're not honest players. Um, this is just on a personal note. If you're gonna rent your home, I just, I just don't know how it would work that you rent out your house and have somebody sleep in your bed and empty out your closet so that you know that they've got their own space and they're not using yours. Something here just doesn't click for me. Um, 
if people are actually renting out their home, they're preparing it already, that they don't have their personal items there. I mean, to have them stolen and people are going to go in your closets and wear your clothes. I just, there's something there that just is odd to me about renting out your house. Um, I had a personal experience with friends staying in my home, and it's, you got to be real careful what you're doing with that kind of thing. Um, this has huge implications for our neighborhoods. And there, currently in our neighborhood, there is a home that's being rented out, and everybody is uncomfortable. We don't know who's there. We don't know why they're there. The reality of the world that we live in, we live in a state with legalized pot. And I think that that's a piece of this that we at least need to consider uh, folks coming to the state. And maybe in some neighborhoods they're okay with that kind of activity. Other neighborhoods would be very uncomfortable with that kind of activity. Um, I think Councilman Abel already addressed the ADUs. I have huge concerns that we're going to have ADUs that are going to um, morph into this kind of rental unit. Um, I can't remember which councilman brought it up regarding the kitchens. I think that was Karen. Um, and, and you? The reality is, you know, are these kitchens being inspected? I mean, how do you really know how clean a kitchen is, and particularly if it's a and b if um, you're serving food, do we have a process in place that we know um, how clean that food is and how clean the kitchen is? There's a lot of implications here for public health. Um, Also, it's been mentioned this is a nice way for seniors to stay in their homes. On a personal level, my dad was has a house that he could rent out the upstairs, and frankly, the man up there was abusing him in different ways. We've got to be real careful the way we open up our seniors to keep them in their homes to be renting something out with that as the precept. I'm not real comfortable with that. You know, the kids need to be close by and they need to be monitoring exactly who is in that home and what's going on. Um, as I said, my role um, as a city councilor is different than personal. This might be kind of fun to go to Durango and rent one of these. My kids have done it and they've enjoyed it. But they've been honest players and they've left the home very clean and and nothing was broken. I can't imagine, frankly, leaving your home with somebody else living in it, what you're going to come home to. Um, I think if we as a city council decide to go forward with, with this, because of the implications for our communities, for our neighborhoods, for the people who have invested in their neighborhood, they are paying mortgages, they want a stability in their neighborhood, they want a security in their neighborhood. We need to, at the very least, have some type of a committee that has community input where people are giving us some direction on this. I think this, for me, this is way above something that we as 11 people should be deciding. And that's my input. Councillor Gutwein. Thank you. Um, so I guess to start, I have also stayed at a lot of Airbnbs and I love staying at Airbnb. Um, we, the kids and Chet and I go and uh, it's fun for us to get to, it's like you're getting to live in another city instead of just being a visitor in a hotel. And so you have this really personal experience. You can stay at a, in a walkable one. Um, so, and usually, you know, they have a cleaning service, so you pay additional for the cleaning service, and they come and they clean it, and they, and, and this is just required. So they'll come and clean it, and then, and then it's, 
you know, fresh. And I, I don't borrow anyone's clothes when I'm there, but I'm sure that that could happen. Um, and anyway, so I really like them and have enjoyed them. And I think that it's great. Um, that, it, but again, you know, in terms of what is good for Lakewood, um, we really, I think everyone up here has already said this, but we really have to consider our community character and what works here um, and our, our neighborhoods and, and what their quality of life will be like. And so if we do continue this conversation, I think we have to take into account all of the things that people have brought up, the parking, the insurance. Um, I like the idea of talking about primary residences and not having ADUs be allowed to do this um, for the reasons that other people mentioned. I think we could maybe even look at limiting how many rooms you could rent out and limit that so that you're not, you know, in my house I couldn't rent out four different rooms, um, you know, maybe maybe one, I don't know. Um, um, and I haven't ever rented out my house, just for the record. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a couple of questions. Um, the cities that have a policy, do they have a good participation rate in their licenses? So, for example, we have a rule of no, you know, they're not allowed, but there's still 300 that are active. When they do license them, are most of the, do, do we know if, most of the participating um, Airbnbs are licensed, if that makes sense. It does. So, excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so Denver really just started enforcing this dis in January of 2017. So I've reached out to them to see how many licenses they have. We know that there's approximately 3,000 uh, rental units in Denver, city and county. So I'm curious, because they've got data now um, so that'll be something I'll have to follow up with you in terms of their compliance but they have certainly implemented an online platform that makes it pretty easy for folks to um, you know basically give their information self-disclose you know if they've got permission from their landlord so a primary residence doesn't just mean an owner um, it could oh, be if you're a renter and it's your primary residence and the landlord says oh yeah go ahead and rent it out it's your primary residence um, you can do that as well in Denver so um, we can follow up with those statistics I'm curious to know as well kind of how many are complying because their system is so easy um, but we can we can follow up with that one now, I'd be interested to know because if you know one of the main goals here is to and encourage compliance, then I'd want to make sure that if we actually do something that there's reason to think it, it will help. Um, and that brings up another question for me, which is what are the other cities doing to enforce? Um, are they monitoring Airbnb sites? Are they relying on complaints um, and that kind of thing? Do you? So again, I'll just stick with Denver for the moment. Um, Fort Collins just passed it in March, so they're really new, um, so they don't have a lot of data, but uh, Denver does have two staff members dedicated to looking through the Airbnb posts. Um, their username is Denver Government, I think, so they, they're not trying to be sneaky about it. Um, they just go through and have someone looking through, because when you um, go through their online system, you get a license number, and if that license number is not on your listing, um, then they can contact you and, and that's when they go through the enforcement and they do have a fine if you're not operating with a license now. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So they have a fine too. Okay. That's good. And do you know, I, I, I've used Airbnb to go and stay, but I've never rented out. Do they, when you start an Airbnb, do they, um, does Airbnb let you know that you might want to check with your city to make sure you're allowed to do this or to see if they get licensed? Because I'm just wondering how someone's going to know to do this. It's, it's really up to the communities to create a marketing and communities, you know, program so we can get the word out. Okay. Airbnb is really not in the business of, you know, helping us regulate their users. Right. So across the board, they're, you know, if if we do end up going forward and you know they offer to we could collect taxes from them they wouldn't disclose who's paying their taxes either so okay. they're not really in the business of, of providing additional information okay. about their 
user. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, so we have information about if um, code enforcement gets calls, but does our police department also get calls? Um, just, you know, someone mentioned like pot smoking complaints and sound complaints. So I'm wondering if, you know, if the police go out and, and have a complaint like that, if they are finding that they're Airbnbs or if it's just handled the same way as always, or if there's a process in place there. I, th I think we'd have to follow up with you on that. Um, what you, the information that we provided you were specifically to the short-term rentals, mm -hmm. and we don't know if there was another complaint right. before or after, um, so we would, we would have to check to see uh, and probably do some comparisons. I would need to get with uh, code enforcement and talk with them, but we can get you some more information on what are actually short-term rentals and, and what are other complaints that may be at a short-term rental that we didn't realize when the complaint went out. Okay, that sounds good. I think that's just something that maybe we would, as we continue this, just need to think about letting people know maybe on our website what to do if your neighbor has a short-term rental, who to contact. Um, and final question is, um, is our lodging tax, would this be subject to TABOR, our TABOR limits? I don't think so. We're debruced, right, on the lodging fund? Okay. Yeah. So, no. So, yeah, the lodging tax is, is uh, TABOR exempt. Okay, great. Not. Okay. Oh. So, we got conflicting. So it would be subject to TABOR restrictions. Okay. If I could jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, the, the, any short-term rental, as, as uh, in my response to Mr. Abel was, it would be subject to accommodations, lodging tax, and, and sales and use tax. Um, it, it would count as far as, you know, our total amount of tax that we collect and we, our total revenue that we collect so you know if we were to collect, collect more revenue as a result of permitting or allowing um, short-term rentals then yes that would that would that would apply to our Tabor, Tabor maximum yeah. okay great okay um also I should have said this at the beginning but thank you so much for this presentation um it was really well done and I a lot of the questions that I had were answered in this presentation, um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have a few comments, maybe a question tagged in here somewhere. As uh, somebody who in my day life, my industry has been affected by the shared economy tremendously, but that's the way things happen. That's the evolution, but it's a similar story in transportation you know, becoming the largest transportation company in a matter of a decade with billions of dollars. So I know that for me, at least, you know, the regulatory equality is important, but also trying to be progressive and adapt is important too. So what is that balance? And I think the council did a nice job tonight, you know, talking about some of those concerns and things that we need to follow. Taxation for me, especially, you know, and, and looking at some of the regulations that our brick and mortar have to follow, and deal with and uh, go through. I mean, I think that's fair to examine mm -hmm. as we go forward. Um, there's a comment about marijuana use and, you know, like it or not, there's a constitutional right in, in your house to utilize that. And I think that applies to folks that um, are visiting as well. And I'm not sure exactly how that all works, but I'm, I'm sure there's some information on other communities that have had to, to go about doing that. And then buyer beware, you don't go in a decade from nothing to being larger than the largest hotel chain that started 50 or 60 years ago. So there's a proven track record of something going on where there is some safety and people continue to use this. I remember Shakti telling me when she stayed at one in D.C., it actually struck you because the gentleman, everything he had was there. So there was this trust that you were coming into his house. And uh, it's a little bit different for me. My neighbor's an airline pilot, and uh, before he moved, they would bring, you know, people would come in, and he had a little lock closet downstairs where he put his stuff, and we had folks in and out. It was, it was a, quite an interesting deal. Some people like it, some people don't. But I think it's important that I would say we move forward in looking at some sort of regulation 
and having a, a larger conversation with the community and the different stakeholders that are part of our community. So that's kind of my two cents. And at the end of the day, health, safety, and welfare. Uh, commonality in all of those ordinances through the other communities had a lot to deal with, you know, fire, uh, carbon monoxide, things like that to make sure that who's ever staying in there is some sort of safety. And then, um, yeah, so that's it. That's all I got. We're back up on the lights. Ms. Franks. I just wanted to add a couple quick points. I certainly uh, agree with Councillor Johnson about the safety concern for our seniors. But if you look at that is the short term versus long term, somebody could have a, an abusive long term renter there and that's not against our rules. So just kind of to kind of show that the, the dual side of that, that a long term rental situation could be equally or more abusive uh, based on that. So we certainly want to keep our, our community safe in a bunch of respects. I also did want to comment about the um, uh, what several people mentioned is not everybody may be aware. And if Airbnb and these other places aren't sharing that with people, that not everyone knows what they're doing is not legal. I had a young family contact me who had been reported, and it was their way of trying to keep one of the parents home as a stay-at-home parent, and they were trying to augment income. And as soon as they were turned in, they immediately ceased and desisted and reached out to me to see what relief. So I think that there are people who just clearly don't know that that's going on. Um, I think the fact that people come in for a business license and don't know is another indicator that maybe we've not done a great job at educating people. Um, I also wanted to, in your future research to find out if there's any, there is any interaction between these, um, you know, providers and the communities, if they're trying to develop any kind of a partnership, or if maybe the hospitality industry is seeking any legislation which would level the playing field and give them relief. I think that they have as much of a responsibility to be good players in our community, and we shouldn't have to be outreaching the other direction so i'd like to see what's going on in the hospitality industry and maybe if these groups have a you know lobbying group or a coalition or something where we can reach out and see well what can we do proactively rather than this punitive sort of reactionary uh, stance thank you i have councillor abel johnson shakti uh, the marijuana angle i have some questions about if people allow incidental use I, I would have no problem with that I think we should consider though whether we can point fingers at somebody who's as in one of the uh, Airbnb single room things I saw today 420 and pet friendly okay you can have your dog there but is that advertising a marijuana business so I, I think we need to make some distinction there. If people are advertising it for the marijuana use, does that comply with our ban on marijuana businesses? Um, I think it's worth debate. I don't know where I'd come down on that. Also, a lot of apartment uh, houses have guest suites or guest facilities so that if you know your aunt and uncle come to visit, uh, you can house them in your complex for a few bucks are we on top of that are we charging those folks lodging tax and should we consider that as a uh, airbnb because it's not a permanent uh, lodging facility in general um, there are concerns about the number of people in a unit I know in our original uh, zoning amendment where these things were contained that caused us to want to have the study session one of the item 8 said shall not be subject to a maximum number of guests per night now, I know if you have you know, uh, two siblings and their families you know you wind up with 12 folks there already and I wouldn't want to prohibit that but then if you uh, have no limit of unrelated guests I don't know how many of you folks might have been to spring break call it uh, Lakewood's not a big spring break town but I can't imagine having 10 unrelated uh, young folks 
partying together in uh, an ADU or, or in a neighborhood. Um, so we might think about that as well. I do like the idea of a in required insurance rider. Uh, also, unless we have some kind of limit on how many days these things can operate, then you're going to have folks with somebody uh, you know, in, the, in the bottom suite of their house, the basement uh, uh, bedroom, 365 days a year, granted different people, but it's like adding more, it's doubling the uh, density of, a, of that home. Uh, I think the special use is a good idea. I'd like to, I don't want these things to be in every other house. Uh, I think that's just too much. Uh, yeah, uh, with a special use permit, wouldn't we then require neighborhood participation uh, Correct. In, in the permitting process? Thank you. Uh, as to Ms. Johnson's point, it, I wouldn't want anyone uh, <clears throat> rummaging through my things, but a host's risk is the host's risk. He assumes that risk. The neighbor doesn't assume any risk, and I don't want them to be put in any sort of position where uh, their property could be lost without recompense. Uh, and as far as enforcement goes, we could enforce it now the same way Denver does, except we don't have to look for the permit number because we don't have permits. So um, I believe we used to have what was referred to as a sales tax bounty hunter, a person who would call, uh, or use tax bounty hunter, a person who would call businesses who had not filed their use tax papers and say, got to pay up. Uh, Maybe we could find uh, a contractor who would do that sort of thing now, but 700 folks that are advertising out there is a bit beyond the pale for us to overlook as uh, harmless, I guess. Uh, and <coughs> I don't have a firm opinion on it, but I wonder if we should look at whether we want to include all uh, residential districts. And, and Councilor yes, Abel, so the, the numbers Aaron came up with, like we said, we're not sure what that exact sure. number is, Six. but um, it, doesn't it doesn't mean also that they're all being leased. They're participating in there, but, you know, maybe they're advertising for a certain week during the year um, when they're out. So... The, the, that number doesn't mean they're all active at this point in time. I understand oh. that, but if they're advertising for it and we don't allow it, uh, we should at least say cease and desist until we put something together. That is another, another thing. Uh, we need to do this. We need to get this done. Uh, I don't want to say with haste because government shouldn't move with haste, but I think we need to consider that the uh, vacation period's coming, it's right up on us here. Uh, we will have more of these non-compliant things. We'll have more people who want to uh, make a few bucks off of it. I don't want to see folks become uh, uh, hotel operators out of their house just to increase their income. Uh, I understand the, the problems with caring for uh, aging parents and trying to stay, aging folks trying to stay in their home or young folks trying to help with the mortgage. But uh, that has, this could have a huge effect on their neighbors and I, I don't want to see that uh, <coughs> situation arise. Thank you. So to Mr. Abel's point too, not only do uh, some of our apartments have kind of mother-in-law apartments for guests, CCU, memory care a lot of our new nursing homes now are starting to add an area to where folks can stay and i mean i don't know where you draw the line but you know to i would have heartburn at a skilled nursing facility or a memory care unit to try to charge for a complimentary room a lodger's tax but i have no idea that's something that could be part of the research could I just piggyback on that? If it's complimentary, there's no reason to charge them. Yeah. But some of these folks charge for that service. So, Ms. Johnson? 
Thank you. <clears throat> I guess the point I was trying to make is that if you actually are renting out your home and you've got bedrooms that you're probably going to empty your closets rather than leave your things in them. <laughs> and so that to me speaks of a business in and of itself that you're that you're creating that. Also, is there are there it, any data regarding the Airbnbs regarding police activity that is needed for those separate than what it would be without them. My feeling is is that you're you're giving somebody a key to your home, and there are some folks that are going to go and have another key made, and then come back. I um, I can see where we could have some real issues and I realize it's not our place to worry about it but it is our place when the police are going to be called on these different situations just a thought Ms. Shakti then Ms. Vincent just a quick thought I think that on some of the sites there's some kind of insurance in it and I don't know just in the regular fee and I don't know what it covers exactly but we should look into that as part of our insurance conversation Ms. Vincent um, yes I just I guess I I have a comment um, all the questions that I would have asked have been asked but I what I found so interesting was the discussion about uh, whether I'd like to stay in a hotel or whether I'd like to stay in an Airbnb and how do you know what kind of um, house you're going into with an Airbnb um, and I'd just like to point out to the uh, council that there's probably many places specifically on Colfax which many people even though it's a hotel or motel would not prefer to stay so I'm just throwing that out <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of great questions, and um, I, I think there's a consensus that council would like to move forward and direct staff to, to continue to work on this and um, look at the rules and regulations pertaining to this issue. Is that cool? So that I'm getting? Okay. Can I, can I add to Mayor? Um, with that direction, then we will dig deeper into the conversations that may answer some of your questions, at least anecdotally, in terms of other cities and what kind of um, issues they've had um, with some of the concerns that you've brought up. So we'll have more information. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, actually. I think ultimately because of the potential impact on our city on many levels that we should have some type of uh, community input with this have a committee with different homeowners associations businesses some of them maybe somebody from the Marriott and Sheraton I think there really needs to be a lot more dialogue than what we are going to generate up here and what staff can get Frank I think staff you, you were you were clear on that as well absolutely yep. um, this is one of those make sure we've had broad conversation you've had a chance to um, talk to all your constituents all the different stakeholder groups etc so that we're not stepping into something with unintended consequences so uh, totally agree I, I agree with Councillor Abel as well we need to take this slowly and be really deliberate with this process Ms. Gutwein I was just gonna say I as we're looking at different policy options um, it's really helpful to me when we look at the more suburban um, cities for examples even though it's great I think we can learn a lot from the bigger cities too um, in terms of because they have probably a lot more usage of this but that might help us find the best fit for Lakewood um, as a more suburban place thank you all right no more questions or comments on that I'll reopen public comment on the presentation you just heard anybody wish to speak come on down Mar, if you could, after the meeting, leave your address with the clerk. We didn't have it last time you spoke, so thank you. Good evening, everybody. Happy belated Easter. On the subject of short-term rentals, um, if the council votes to move forward on allowing this, 
I would beseech you, please, do not do it unless you do it simultaneously with addressing the parking issue. Um, and I submit to you, once again, my proposed ordinance that no vehicle of any type may park for more than five hours in a 24-hour period in front of any private property without the owner's expressed permission would solve a lot of the issues you raised about how many people per night and where they're going to park and density. There's one across the street from me, people operating illegally. We happen to know through neighborhood conversations, they don't carry the commercial license, so if they're, God forbid, their house burns down or something happens with this, they don't have the proper homeowner's policy because they don't have a business rider. So I would also urge you, second to having the parking addressed, that you require the proper commercial business policy. Um, but again, I submit to you, my requested parking ordinance would take care of a lot of these issues. Because, for example, the one across the street from me has a three-car garage and a three-car driveway, but their guests are not allowed to park there. So the three guests per night park in front of their house or my house or my neighbor's house. And there are strangers that come and go, mostly from out of state, usually men, once in a while couples, in a neighborhood that's predominantly elementary school age children. So that's a concern for the neighbors. I've heard a lot of talk about protecting the host and the guest, but I think the bigger picture here is that's free will to engage in an Airbnb as a host or a guest, if it's legal. The neighbors in the neighborhood is the primary concern here in voting for this. And lastly, as just a point of information, I know quite a few people that do this. They are rented out if they're in a good location of a nice facility 365 days a year from anywhere from one to four people a night. So that's the kind of impact that it can have on a neighborhood. So thanks for considering those points. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Davis, come on down. And again, could you just check in with the clerk? You can do it after the meeting to make sure we have your information unless you want to share it with us here. Uh, sure. Charles Davis, uh, 790 Crescent Lane. Um, one of the things I'd, ha I'd be interested in hearing about this is how much tax revenue, sales tax revenue, small business revenue comes into a city because they offer this type of service legally to the environment. Because we have a lot of small businesses that could really benefit from all this increased capacity of people coming here versus staying in Denver or staying in Arvado, Fort Collins. And I think that's a huge opportunity for our city. So Great. that's all. Interesting. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. I will close public comment. And uh, Ms. Amar, if, if, we, if you know that's happening, code enforcement can be contacted. And it's not, it's an anonymous pro process. So you can contact code enforcement if we know that's happening and they will respond. So, okay. All right, reports. Oh, before I go to reports. So we have a community grant program that, uh, as I said last week, has a process with the mayor pro tem and council president as well as Lakewood Legacy. And uh, there's a list of applicants that apply and this group will look at that and then make the recommendation to council. We uh, thought we got rid of all of our conflicts, but Mr. Coop is conflicted and Ms. Shakti is conflicted and Karen Harrison is conflicted. So I'm looking for a volunteer who would be willing to be part of this screening committee. And again, this is just the screening committee that recommends. So Ms. Johnson, is there consensus for Ms. Johnson? Okay, you're it. And ironically, I almost just went right to you because you were on it last year, but we didn't know how we were going to do it all. So um, you'll be getting that information because it looks like they're going to meet on the 26th, which is next Wednesday to start looking at it. So we'll make sure that Mary gets you that information. Mayor, may I, may I interrupt? Yeah. Might you read the list of applicants so we're sure there's not another conflict? So I, I shared the list with council and there was not. If you'd like me to read it, I'd be more than happy to. No, I, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, reports, Mr. Coop, Mr. Wickman. 
Well, not a report. Do we have general business? A question. I'm just wondering, where are we at with uh, Amara's um, suggested uh, ordinance? I, I think she submitted it, or is it somewhere in the in the pipeline? So twofold, if I might. One is, did you submit that via the process for a study session? Okay. Ms. Franks will speak to that. And Ms. Hodson, go ahead. Uh, well, so our intent after a meeting when we talked about parking, our intent was to look at the different options um, and the different pain points in our community. One would be um, around the schools, another around residential, and then we also talked about what might those resolutions be. Additional restrictions, maybe permitting parking, and then this may be another option, and that be limitations of parking by time frames. So we can fold that in. I don't know that there's been a formal submittal, but I think we intended to have that as part as one of the options for resolutions. Ms. Franks will follow up. I just wanted to add that uh, Councillor Johnson has uh, filled out the paperwork to start that process of a formal request, and I signed on to that tonight. So I'm not sure if she's looking for other signers, but we filled that out, and so that will be a formal request. Great. Ms. Gutwein? Ms. Franks? Ms. Harrison? No report. Mr. Royball? Oh, boy. We're having our Ward 3 meeting this Saturday at Phillips United Methodist Church starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. That's all I have. Ms. Vincent? No report. Mr. Abel? No report. Ms. Johnson? No report. Ms. Shakti? Oh, I have reports. Uh, drug Take Back Day, Saturday, April 29th, between 10 and 2 at the police department. Uh, free yard waste cleanup events, uh, 8.30 to noon on April 29th and May 6th, and that's the parking lot of Jeffco Public Schools building, 809 Quail Street, and Saturday is Earth Day, if I'm right. Yep, I got any nods. Yep, Saturday is Earth Day, and so there's an event at the Heritage Center. Ms. Shakti, what was the, your last announcement you just made? Earth Day. Okay. And for clarification, the prescription drop-off, uh, folks can just drop off, right? They don't have to get out of their vehicle. I'm pretty sure for our seniors, they have it mobile to where you can just drop off. But we can get that information. Did you mention all the events for Earth Day? No, I just did very generally. You could do more specifics. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking for it, but uh, Earth Day on saturday and there are a lot of events and i think there's an electronics recycling going on that day as well so you can go to um lakewood.org slash earth day and that'll give you all and a beer garden i guess allegedly <laughs> good to know what's earth day without a beer garden michelle anything no. mr graham Ms. Hodson. I would like to make one announcement, and that's about the middle school art exhibit. It opened on April 12th. It goes through May 7th. It's, it's a real popular show. It's at the North and Mezzanine Galleries at the Liquid Cultural Center. It's such a cool event to see our middle school artists. I would encourage all of you to, um, to visit those exhibits. There's also a, um, a free opening reception on April 27th. Um, this is one of my personal favorites. It's so cool to see the talent in the middle school um, students. Thank you. Yep, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff. And then for council, if you have not had the opportunity to fill out the survey from the retreat, please do so. As soon as we get that put up, we can get it out to the public and staff can get an idea of, of how we can start to look at your priorities for 2017. So with that, anything else? Seeing none. Thank you to our police agent for hanging out with us tonight, and uh, have a good night. I saw you, and my heart skipped a beat. It felt a thrill from my head to my feet. I know you see so far above me I thought you'd never love me I dared to dream that you could love me too 
I saw you.